jump over to the book of 1 Corinthians. So we're going to continue our teaching through that book, and um, this is, this is a, just a letter, as we're reminded of, just a letter that uh, Paul wrote. That's why we're calling this series Dear Church, um, because uh, just as Paul wrote this letter to the church um, over in Corinth, we also know that this letter really actually applies uh, to us today. And um, man, uh, it's, it's kind of been a roller coaster, um, hasn't it been? Um, if you've been follow al- following along with this uh, series, man, it's been very interesting, especially as of late. And uh, as with uh, most roller coasters, the most exciting runs are toward the end, okay? And, and so, so this one is, is one of those exciting loops that we're going to get to do um, as we're, we're on this ride with Paul. But uh, he is going to specifically be talking to us about the spiritual gifts of tongues and prophecy. And uh, man, if um, I don't know what your background is, if you're Pentecostal or, you know, if you came from a very traditional, you know, Southern Baptist church, I don't know what it is, but I guarantee you we all come at this from very different perspectives. And uh, really our goal today is just let's hear the Word of God. Let's hear what, what uh, the church has taught. And then if we need to make changes and be open to something or close the door on something else, let's, let's do that based upon the Word of God, not based upon tradition. Um, we come under the authority of Scripture today. And uh, as, we, as we learned last week, man, if we don't do this with love, this is unprofitable. It's nothing, and at worst, it can, um, it can be kind of annoying and uh, bring division into the church. And so what we want to do is we want to just go to Scripture with an attitude of let's love God and let's follow Him and love one another the way that He desires. Let's just learn. Let's just learn today. Um, And so I I guarantee you there's going to be a little bit more heavy on the side of teaching today than preaching, Um, but but just buckle in, okay? uh, You're going to learn a lot, all right? So let's pray and um, ask God to bless this time. Father, thank you for your word God, we, we've just uh, already been blessed on this Palm Sunday, being able to just gather to say, Hosanna, Lord, we bless you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And Lord, as, um, as we know that Jesus has ascended into heaven, Lord, promise that his spirit would come and Lord, would be our helper, would empower us. And Lord, you said that um, we would do greater things than, than we even saw you do. Lord, we, um, we just want to just, just uh, open up our hearts toward what uh, you have to teach us today. And um, Lord, just, uh, just learn from you. Lord, sit at your feet this morning and um, at, at the feet of uh, what, what your word has to say. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, before we start with chapter 14, um, I want to just give you... Um, four, actually five different positions that people actually take. And I said, this is going to err on the side of just teaching, okay? So just picture we're in a classroom right now, just, just to begin before we get into the Word of God. Because I said, we all come at this from, from very different backgrounds. So I just, just want to lay this out um, just because you might find yourself in one of these, okay? Um, so, so what I want to talk about is, first of all, we're going to try and cure, cure charismatic confusion, Okay, and the first thing I want to do is just just lay out five views that people have on spiritual gifts, and by that, um, what we mean is uh, those gifts that are more miraculous um, in their practice, gifts of healing, speaking in tongues, um, uh, the the gifts of of prophecy, and um, and and so so those are those are some of the things that we're talking about right now. Okay, first position that I want to just let you know about is uh, a lot of people have the view of uh, we call it cessationism, okay? You're a cessationist. So it's the cessationist position. It holds that gifts like prophecy, tongues, and healings have ceased. And uh, that these gifts were actually given to the early church as a sign for them um, that were relevant only to them and uh, that they have actually ceased in our day, all right? Now, I'll just be honest with you. I even though maybe it wasn't stated directly, I would say that I grew up with this kind of view being taught to me and being, being practiced. Um, it was kind of taboo to hear someone speak in tongues or to receive a word of prophecy or to expect a miraculous on-the-spot 
healing, okay? And, um, and, and so what was used to justify this belief was actually the teachings of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, if, if you uh, remember back, it, uh, it, it says there, um, as for tongues, they will cease, da-da-da-da-da, they will be still, as for prophecy, you know, um, until the perfect comes. And uh, what, what people would say is that, um, you know, this was, this was just only for the early church. Um, but what, what I'm learning actually is with 1 Corinthians 13, it's not an argument against that these gifts have ceased. It's actually an argument that they will continue until the perfect comes. Who is the perfect? It's Christ. His return, his kingdom. And so we are literally, as 1 Corinthians 13 talks about, we, we are looking through a mirror dimly. And so like these, these miraculous gifts, um, these sign gifts we call them, or these you know, more miraculous spiritual gifts, they're just, a, they're just like a looking at a mirror dimly, seeing just the expression of the kingdom of God coming to earth. And, um, and so that, that's the way that I'm seeing it right now. I'm not seeing that the Bible actually in any way justifies this blanket claim that the gifts have ceased. ceased okay? um, I don't know where you're at with that, um, but that's one of the views. Okay? Um, Paul actually also ends this, um, this chapter telling the Corinthians do not forbid the practice of these gifts. And so I want to honor that. Um, and and, uh, and so, so that's, that's the cessationist position. Number two is the Pentecostal position. Um, how many of you maybe uh, have experience uh, attending a Pentecostal church? Yeah, a number of you. Yeah, okay. We, we, we love you. And we are glad that you are part of Valley Church because... We actually can learn a lot from you, okay? Believe it or not, uh, we're, we're so grateful for that. You kind of balance us out, okay? Um, Pentecostalism, uh, the Pentecostal position, believes that these gifts are actually in full operation and that every Christian should experience them. But if you haven't experienced them, you should maybe question to see if there is something wrong with you spiritually. And that may be, be part of your background growing up in church. Now, a step, from, a step back from that is what we would call then the third position, and that is the, the charismatic position. And uh, this believes that uh, each of these gifts are in existence. They're part of the normal ministry and experience of the church, even though not every believer experiences them. And then um, back from that is a fourth position, usually goes under the name, the open but cautious position. And I think a lot of, a lot of us may be there. I, I would say that um, I have been there and I am still kind of there right now. Um, but this position believes that the gifts have not ceased, but that some of the ways that these gifts are being used today in so-called spirit-filled churches is neither biblical nor is helpful. And uh, there may be a lot of manipulation, psychological tricks involved in some of these places, okay? And so I would say that this view raises some valid concerns. Um, and, and like I said, I still find myself being a little overly critical sometimes. Um, but I, I've actually become more and more uncomfortable with holding to this kind of position, um, because uh, just simply having an attitude of openness towards spiritual gifts is not what Paul is asking us to do. He's actually asking us to desire these gifts. And you'll see that in the chapter that we're going to look at. But, I mean, if you just read verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 14, you'll see it just says plainly, pursue love, okay, jumping off of chapter 13, and then earnestly desire spiritual gifts earnestly desire. Okay, don't just be open to them. Desire them. And um, especially this one, that you may prophesy. And we'll explain that in a little bit, what that is. So I guess where I would, where I would counsel you is just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, there are some bad actors in probably every single one of these positions, okay? Um, but don't, don't throw it all away just because there's some bad actors. And um, also at the same time, the Bible does warn that um, many will come and will attempt to 
deceive and lead many astray with deceitful doctrine. And so we need to know the scripture and we need to be discerning of, uh, of the practices that are happening, happening, whether in the church or without the church, and, um, and, and pay attention and discern whether or not these things are from God when we see them, especially today. Um, we need to watch out for things that are trying to mix Christianity with other religions like, like Hinduism, paganism, witchcraft, new age, the occult, just to name a few. Okay, These are practices that are you know, trying to seep into the church. And, uh, and so we need to just be on our guard against these things and be discerning. Okay, And we'll, we'll see some counsel in chapter 14 about how to do that. The fifth position is this. Um, I'm going to just call this the Valley Church position, okay? Um, And whether or not you accept it or not, that's okay. We're all kind of on a journey here. Um, We're all growing. Um, But I would would say that uh, you wouldn't find this in most theology books, but it would go under maybe a a summary, charismatics with a seatbelt, Charismatics with a seatbelt, okay? Basically, it's a combination of positions three and four, and, um, and it recognizes the validity of spiritual gifts, earnestly desires them, yet um, has a seatbelt. Paul tells us in chapter 14, let's do everything decently and in order, okay? And so that's why you're not going to see me after church lining people up here. We're not going to have like this altar call where people are going to line up and I'm going to smack them on the head and, and they're going to fall over and, and his bodies are going to hit the floor, okay? Have you seen that YouTube video? If not, watch it, okay? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, you're not going to see people just like, you know, laughing in the spirit hysterically, uttering a bunch of nonsensical words, um, falling down, slain in the spirit. I'm not saying the spirit doesn't ever do that. I'm just saying that um, Paul does argue for things to be done decently and in order. He'll teach that in chapter 14. All in all, I do want us to experience all that the Spirit of God has for us here at Valley Church and not just merely be open to it, but desirous of what the Spirit wants to do and expectant that God is going to work. And so um, two of these spiritual gifts that we're going to talk about are prophecy and speaking in tongues. And so let's jump into, into 1 Corinthians. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. All right. Okay. Some of you are ready. Let's go. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, it says this, Pursue love. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Let's just focus in on um, just talking about tongues for a second. Um, You'll see where where he says, the one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men, but to God. And um, here's a working definition for tongues. This is from Wayne Grudem. I don't think that he has a corner on this definition, but it's a a decent one. He says, um, tongues is a form of prayer and praise you express to God in a language you do not understand. Now, we see this demonstrated actually in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 is, um, I'll just read it for you. It says, says there in verses 1 through 4 that when the day of Pentecost arrived, that um, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a rush, mighty rushing wind. This is like a hurricane force, Okay. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So just imagine that. Okay, we're, we're gathered here and a rushing wind starts flowing through this building, and, and we, we, start, we, we have all these tongues of fire come on top of our head, and uh, we start, start speaking in different languages as the Spirit empowers us to do so. Okay, this, this is an awesome image of the Spirit of God coming into His church. Uh, this is the power 
that you and I actually do have within us. Because the Spirit of God, He dwells in each of His, each of His believers, okay? Each of His children. Verse 5 keeps on going. Now there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. After, after uh, these verses, actually, what, what, you'll, what you'll see is that they actually thought that these people were drunk, because they were speaking in these different languages, okay? And uh, then, you know, so, someone stands up, he's like, you know, <laughs> look, these guys aren't drunk, okay? It's, it's only the morning, okay? And so unless you're used to having a breakfast beer, they're not drunk, okay? Um, they're just, they're filled with the Spirit, okay? I don't know if I'm speaking to anybody today, but <laughs> hopefully not, okay? The key here is, is that these were other languages that these people were speaking, human languages. These tongues and acts uh, were not just these ecstatic utterances of nonsensical noises. They were praising God in actual, intelligible language. And um, they may not have known what they were saying, but the Spirit was empowering it to say it to somebody. Somebody knew it. Somebody understood it. And that's where the amazement was, okay? These tongues were actually a sign that God was bringing other nations into his family. And I want you to think about tongues in that regard. They're a testimony that God was fulfilling the promise that he gave to Abraham. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Every tribe, every language Okay, um, that's, that's what God was showing. It was a sign that God was welcoming all people under the, the work of Christ into his kingdom. That's what tongues were, okay? It's kind of the reversal of, of Babylon. Uh, sorry, not Babylon, but the, the Tower of Babel. Remember at the Tower of Babel, God, you know, everyone had one, one language. God confused their language and they spread across the earth. Well, here God is bringing all the nations together under under one spirit, under one king. And tongues were a sign of that. Um, as we go on, let's, let's just move over and jump, about, jump over to talk about prophecy. Okay, verse 3 talks about that. So follow along, 1 Corinthians 14, 3. It then says, On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding. Um, and encouragement and consolation. Those are three very key words. Upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. I want to just give you, um, as we just teach on this uh, subject of prophecy for a second, just give you three different forms that prophecy comes in. Uh, it's not limited to this, but these are primary forms. Um, number one is uh, the preaching of God's word. Um, like what we're doing here right now. The preaching of his word is happening. And this is, this is more than just like reading the scripture and explaining it. No, um, when the word of God is preached, we view that the word of God is living and it is active. Um, as scripture says it, it's sharper than any double-edged sword dividing uh, between joints and, and marrow, um, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Oh, God's word does this to us. It just kind of opens up our heart and it changes us. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what my words are. When the word of God speaks, I mean, it, it does some work, okay? Um, and so there is dynamic power um, that, uh, that is active when we preach the word of God. And um, let me just, just uh, point this out. Um, the point of the word of God is to, when it is preached, is to build you up. It's to encourage you, um, to deepen you in your faith, and, uh, and to bring you comfort. And I, I grew up in the church, and I, I, I don't know how many sermons that I have listened to, but I can tell you right now that I have received encouragement and exhortation. Um, I've been built up and comforted by the Word of God being preached and uh, I, I don't know if you can raise your hand if you've had that happen to you as well. Have you had that happen to you by the word of God? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Okay, well, praise God. You've received uh, just one of God's designs for the work of prophecy. Um, God, God's word, the preaching of the word has dynamic power to do that, to encourage, uh, build you up, and bring comfort to you. Second, second primary form of prophecy is this, though. It is uh, in the form of words of wisdom. And this is when God reveals something to someone that they would not naturally know themselves. And so when you share it with someone else, it then builds that other person up, it encourages them, and it brings comfort to them. Now, to be clear, um, uh, anything in these next two categories that we are going to talk about, whether preaching or words of wisdom, or we're going to get into number three, words of knowledge, this is not a thus says the Lord. No, the the Word of God has primary authority, and words of prophecy can be fallible. And so so Paul is going to give us some some, uh, information on how to test these words. But that's the second thing, words of wisdom, okay? And then the, the third one is words of knowledge, words of knowledge. And this is when God reveals something to someone that... um, that they would um, not naturally know about a particular situation. Um, and they share it with someone. Maybe it's, maybe it's a vision that they had. Maybe it's a dream that God gave to them. Maybe it's just a thought that, that God had entered into their mind that um, was to encourage or comfort um, or, or to build them up. Okay, and when, when they share that, they, they bring encouragement and comfort to that person. Again, this is all done in love. It's not done out of an effort to look more spiritual than someone else. Um, this, is, this is done to build up the church, okay? And again, Scripture is always the authority and, and the judge as to whether or not that word from the Lord is actually legitimate or not, okay? And so, um, one thing that uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians is this, and I want to bring this Scripture up for you. He says, do not despise prophesying, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. So our perceptions of what the Spirit is saying are fallible. We can get it wrong. And that's why when someone receives or gives a word of prophecy, we need to test it to see whether or not it is actually from God. And if it is, then let it exhort. Let it encourage. Let it comfort the person for which it was meant. And so Paul, he wants everyone to operate with this gift. And Valley Church, we need more of it. Plain and simple. We want to be led by the Spirit. And we want to be taught by the Word. And so Before we move on, um, let me give you four biblical words that should characterize our use of prophecy at Valley Church. And these are are important words. I encourage you to take notes, write them down. Um, The first word is this. It's the word humility. Humility. Never claim the authority of God when you speak Never, ever, 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 ever say to someone, thus says the Lord. Unless you have a scripture verse to back it up. And you're, you're quoting from the scripture, okay? Um, instead, um, say something like this. Listen, I, I, I feel led that God has given me this you know, for you. God has put this on my heart for you. And I think he might be saying this, but you have to weigh it out with God yourself. You know, what you're saying is fallible, and um, other people need to discern whether or not it's from God. I mean, even think about this. If you come up to someone and say, God told me, or thus says the Lord, that puts you in a pretty awkward position if you're wrong, okay? And so, there are some, you know, religious communities, churches, that misuse this and actually use prophecy to manipulate people to do what they want them to do, okay? That's not what this is for. We're here to build the church up. We're here to encourage, comfort, exhort, all right? So the first word is humility. Um, If you're pretty sure that God has been saying something that you need to share with someone else, and speak it with humility and a little bit of uncertainty, okay? 
The second word is this. It's the word edification. Edification. The purpose of prophecy is for building others up. And, um, and so when someone gives you a word, um, there's a couple tests that I can give you. Um, the, first, the first test is just asking, is this edifying or does this contradict what God has said clearly elsewhere in Scripture? God will never tell you to do something that contradicts his word. Maybe an easy question you can ask is, um, can this be followed up by the phrase, and Jesus wants it that way? And Jesus wants it that way. Okay, so someone comes up to you and says, you know, I think that God is telling me that I, I'm supposed to divorce my wife. And Jesus wants it that way? No, I don't think so. Okay, that's very inconsistent with the word of God. Okay, and so um, another, another question you can, you can ask, this is just kind of a series of questions, is does this word direct me to love Christ more? Um, direct me to his salvation, to my identity in Christ Jesus as a new creation, as a beloved son or a beloved daughter? Um, if not, you should question it. Because, um, you know, one of the things is that Jesus did not come to condemn the world. He came so that the world might be saved through him. I mean, just think about Jesus' words to the woman at the well. You know, he, he knew, he totally knew everything about her. You know, and, and he, he exposed her sin. He, he said, in fact, you have like five husbands, I think, right? You've had five husbands and the person that you're with right now isn't your husband now. Was that a little condemning? Yeah, okay. But, you know, she, he, he didn't leave her there. He, he told her to go and sin no more, okay? And, and so that, that is, that's what we need to understand with words of prophecy is that, um, I mean, if they're overly negative or just like condemning and leaving you with no hope at all, it's probably not from the Lord. Um, but if it's a call to repentance and to follow Jesus, closer, um, in love, man, just, just receive it. And, and even test and see, is this consistent with the scripture? Okay. And this is important that we practice this with, with one another, that we're edifying one another, growing and, and, and constantly changing to align ourselves to, to following Jesus. All right. Also, um, another, another question you can ask is, does this resonate with what God is doing in my life right now? Um, if someone speaks a word to me and it um, resonates with what God is doing, um, then, then I probably should receive it because um, maybe it's just an area that I was not, not aware of that God is, is doing a work. Okay, so humility, edification. The third word is expectation. Let's expect that God is going to do this. He promised with the coming of his Spirit that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. He said that he would do it. And so really it's just like, do you believe that God will do this? Will he do it? Don't just be open to it. Expect it and desire it. And you may be like, well, wait a minute. Isn't prophecy just a gift that only some people have? Isn't, isn't that the way spiritual gifts work? And I'd say, yeah, there are some people that are more gifted in prophecy than others. But it's kind of like the gift of, of generosity. Should all people be generous and, and give? Absolutely. We're all called to be generous and give. Just like we're all called to listen to the Lord. And if we, we receive a word of encouragement, consolation, you know, exhortation, we're to share that, okay? Some people might just receive more than others, all right? Some people may be more gifted in that. And so just, just recognize that. Just because you're like, I don't have that gift, you know, don't write it off, okay? Um, because God has given this to the church um, for the church to be built up. Um, maybe a way that we can expect this is uh, even just in interpersonal relationships um, or in a 242 gathering. Give a moment, you know, just, just when you gather as a group or you gather with a friend, another brother, sister in Christ, just ask like, hey, has God laid anything on your heart that you would like to share? And uh, man, if, if scripture calls us the priesthood of all believers, 
um, man, let's just expect that God doesn't just speak through a pastor or through just elders. Um, he speaks through his body, the church. That's the beauty of the church, okay? So humility, edification, expectation, and the fourth one is affirmation. Affirmation. L- let's affirm those that God uses in our lives to encourage and exhort and um, bring words of comfort to us. I'll tell you what, it takes faith and courage to come up to someone else and um, to share what they have received from the Lord. They may not have even known that's what they were doing. But if you're aware that they were being used by God to speak to you, um, affirm them and thank them for listening to the Spirit of God. So humility, edification, expectation, affirmation. Man, we could say a lot more, um, but uh, we got we to gotta study this chapter, all right? So we're going to move quickly through the rest of this. Um, hopefully you have a basic foundation now on what these things are. But verse 4, we're going to keep on going and, and just, just learning more about his instruction to the church. He said, the one, verse 4, who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So all Paul is saying here is, um, man, I'd love for you all to experience everything, but if you're going to seek a gift, seek prophecy, because the one who prophesies builds up the church. While the one who speaks in tongues builds himself up, unless there's an interpreter, okay? And so he he then goes on to explain, verse 7. If even lifeless instruments such as a flute or a harp do not give distinct noises, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? And so with yourselves... If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a for- it will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves... Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, try, strive to excel in building up the church. So the sole purpose of these gifts is to build up the church. And he, he gives these three illustrations. He talks about um, music, um, you know, playing, playing distinctly, a, a, then a battle blast from a trumpet, giving a clear sound, calling people to battle. And then um, human language talks about, you know, human language being, being intelligible. And his point is that um, we are to build one another up, build the church up by practicing it in this way, okay? Um, just, just even to, to illustrate this quickly um, in regards to what he said about music. Um, music is comprised of, of three different things, okay? There is, there's melody, okay? You can turn it up there. Okay, that's melody. Okay, all right, got it. There's also harmony. I didn't know your pastor was so talented. <laughs> and there's also rhythm, okay? And so we kind of heard that. But, but all in all, if, if, if what you're playing is like... I mean, that just sounds like garbage, okay? And so, so really his, his point in, in teaching in this chapter is just like, hey, like when there's just chaos and it's just like everyone's just doing their own thing, first of all, you can't hear the melody 
You can't hear the harmony, and there's no rhythm, okay? We're a body, and so we've got to work in sync. And he's, he's going to describe then how, how, do we, how do we work in sync so that we build each other up, okay? Not just create a bunch of mess and noise, okay? And so, um, again, this whole purpose of these gifts is to build up the church. Um, verse 13 goes on. Uh, and he, this, this is how he instructs us. Here's how we do this, practice this rightly in the church. Therefore, he says, verse 13, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Wow. Okay. So nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So just, just let me translate that for you. Paul, like definitely, he speaks in tongues. He said, I speak in tongues more than any of you. But it's, it's kind, of, kind of more something that I keep as a private prayer language. And um, when we come and gather as a church, I'd rather speak five words than 10,000 words in a, in a language that nobody understands. Um, it's not going to build the church up. Verse 20, I know a lot could be said, but we got to keep on getting through this chapter. Um, brothers, he says, verse 20, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. So stop acting like, like infants. Stop acting like kids. Maybe thinking that these spiritual gifts make you look impressive. Trying to, you know, be the best in the church. M mature gospel people know that their gifts are for service and not for show. The next part is actually very important. He's going to show you the reason why God gave tongues. Verse 21, in the law it is written, by people of strange tongues, he's quoting from Isaiah 28, and the lips, by the lips of foreigners, as Gentiles, will I speak to this people. He's referring to the Jews. So Gentiles, foreigners are going to speak to the Jews, and even they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, Tongues are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign, not for unbelievers, but for believers. So who is the gift of tongues for? Specifically, it's for unbelieving Jews here in this context. As a testimony that the gospel is not just for them, but it's for the whole world. And that, that's the, that is really the... What we need to understand about tongues is that they're testimony for unbelievers. That's what it is. Love our kids here. <laughs> That's all right. All right. And so we understand the reason why God gave tongues. Again, it's just to show that God's fulfilling his promises, the promises of Abraham. Okay. And then uh, verse 23. Let's keep on going. If therefore the whole church comes together and they all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers they enter, um, will they not say that you are out of your minds? <laughs> but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he's convicted by all and he's called to account by all. Um, the secrets of his heart are disclosed and so falling on his face he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What a testimony. Verse 26, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If, anyone, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three 
or at most three, in each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's not someone to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. I want you to just skip down to verse 36. We'll come back to the other verses. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. Well, there's a lot there, but um, all in all, he's just, again, arguing that um, the way that we practice this, if done wrongly, can kind of go south quickly. Um, Let all things be done decently and in order to build up the church. And, um, you know, I I think here at Valley Church, if you would kind of look at our services, we have the whole decently and in order thing kind of, you know, we, we do pretty well on that. You know, we have an order of worship. We even have a countdown clock, okay? I mean, we start our service right at 10 a.m., okay? And we don't usually deviate that, from that, okay? And, and so Paul would be like, yeah, probably a good job, okay? Maybe. Um, but I think that he would say, Valley Church, um, you need a little bit more freedom of the Spirit to allow for the body of Christ, encourage the body of Christ to exercise these these spiritual gifts to encourage and exhort and comfort one another. And so um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, And uh, you may be like, okay, um, Jonathan, you actually skipped some verses. What about those? Yes, you're right. We skipped some verses. Let's get to them. Just when you thought the chapter couldn't get any harder, um, this this is what Paul says. Jump back to verse 33. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Okay, deep breath. (laughs) Okay, all right, here we go. Um, That's a great way to celebrate um, uh, Women's History Month, isn't it? (laughs) Okay, Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, so let's let's just close our service and pray. All right. (laughs) All right. How how do we need to understand this, man? This is a hard one. Um, Paul, I'll just tell you up front. Paul clearly is not just making this blanket statement that women should never speak in church. You may be like, how do you know that? Well, for one thing, chapter 11, you remember we talked about this, Paul gave instructions for how women were to pray and prophesy in church. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. If you didn't, if you weren't here, um, listen to the message, okay, or read through that text and you'll see. He said that women were to pray and prophesy with their heads covered, okay? And so Paul is not going to give that instruction and then turn around and undo it two chapters later and say that they shouldn't speak at all. That doesn't make sense. So even here in chapter 14, you'll notice that um, Paul has even said, verse 5, he said, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. He said in verse 24, But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he's convicted by all and he's called to account by all. Okay, so he's talking about everybody. Uh, Verse 31, he said, For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be encouraged. So um, it's very clear um, 
Paul is not saying that women can't speak, can't prophesy, can't, you know, can't speak in church, okay? That's just not consistent. Um, a biblical rule for interpretation is that you interpret the harder passages by the easier passages, okay? And so we're going to um, have to practice that in this case. Um, clearly, there is overwhelming evidence of the inclusion of women within the church, within the body, to exercise their gifts um, and, and speak, okay? Um, but what he means by this, I'll just be honest, this is very hard to determine. And you can, you can uh, do an exhaustive study, and what you'll find is that these verses have puzzled nearly every, every person, every scholar, every theologian, um, including even early church theologians that have studied this passage. Um, something that maybe I could buy into, maybe I could understand, is that maybe Paul is furthering this argument saying, just like there's people that kind of are disorderly in the way that they speak in tongues, that they're just shouting out whatever the Spirit has put, put within them, and it's just chaos, kind of like the pounding piano, um, that he's, you know, he gave instruction that, you know, if you're going to do this, that you should have an interpreter, okay? And he said, like, if you're going to, you know, practice prophecy within a, a gathering of the church, that you should do it one by one, and then the prophets, you know, other prophets should then weigh what is said. He could be saying, women, you're kind of getting out of control. You're talking too much in church, okay? Maybe take that back home and, you know, have conversations um, at home with your husband, Okay? I don't know if I like that or not, um, but I'll tell you, and I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive of these words or the transmission of Scripture, because I believe that um, the Word of God uh, is, uh, man, what we have in the Word of God has been given to us very accurately. But um, there is actually, I'll tell you, overwhelming evidence from the earliest transcripts of this um, letter of 1 Corinthians that um, these words actually came at the end, that they weren't verse 33 through 35. Um, they weren't there. They actually came after, after the, the last verses, after verse 40, that they were actually you know, located there first and somehow then moved up. Um, that may come as a surprise to you. Um, again, you're going to have to study this yourself. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Just going to give you the evidence to say someone actually could have added this as commentary to Paul's original letter to say, well, this is how we practice it here in Corinth. You know, this is our culture. And we do know that that culture was very oppressive to women. And so should we further that? No, okay? Um, but uh, all in all, what I want us to do is uh, just um, really operate with, with the attitude that Let's just practice what we do know is clear. This is pretty unclear. Um, there is no qualifications at all to this. And, um, and so let's just be careful that we don't make, like build a whole theology around three verses that possibly could be even contested in Scripture. So um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I know that that's probably not what you wanted but, um, man, I, I really want to have integrity to just not giving you something that's not, like, concrete and I'm not sure about. Um, I really want to be careful. You, you all are smart people, and uh, you have the ability to study God's Word yourself. Um, and so let's not let this divide us. Uh, Paul's goal was that the church might be built up. And really, it takes all of us. Men and women, not just a pastor, not just elders, not just a worship team. Um, it takes all of us exercising our spiritual gifts. Man, if you remember back to, he said, that we're all a body. Not everyone's a hand, not everyone's a foot, not everybody's a mouth, okay? But um, we're to work in sync. And so that takes, that takes all of us. We don't just come to sit and to soak or to take notes. Um, we come into this gathering as a body with the expectation that God is going to speak through you and through you and through you and through you and that um, we, can, we all have years. We have years to listen to God. The problem is sometimes, some of us, we just don't know how to listen. 
And so we got to just silence our heart, you know, the, the internal noise that we have going on. We got to practice silence, solitude, listening to God. And when he speaks and when he gives us a word of encouragement that God has put on our hearts to share, we need to do it. Um, I think that's really the message. And when we do, the church is built up. And so um, maybe you feel like God is speaking to you today. Maybe you feel like God has been speaking to you. Um, Like Samuel, my encouragement to you is this. Just say back to God, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We serve a God who speaks, and he has given us ears to listen. And so let's, uh, let's just pray that God would open us to just listening to him more, that we might build one another up in the Spirit. And uh, let's just close our eyes right now and let's pray. And let's pray and just seek, seek the Lord right now. You know, one of the the biggest encouragements of Scripture comes from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, which says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and he opens the door, I will come in to him. And I will eat with him, and he with me. Let's meditate on those words right now. And open the door to what God might be saying. Just ask ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Jesus, he said, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is to come. Jesus, we thank you for your spirit that you sent as our helper. Lord, as we close our service, we recognize that you are speaking to your church. And so, Lord, we want to listen. And Lord, we want to be those that just uh, encourage and build each other up and comfort one another in the spirit. And so, Lord, help us, Lord, to open up our ears to listen to you. And Lord, when we do, Help us just to be obedient and to follow after you. God, you may be knocking on someone's heart right now. Lord, and saying, open the door. God, I pray for them specifically, God, that they'd open the door of their heart to you. God, that they receive your salvation. They'd receive their new identity in you, Jesus, as the beloved. Lord, that you call them a child, a son or daughter when they repent of their sins and they place their faith in you. God, help them to know that it is not over. It's just the beginning. So we thank you, God, for the way that you're speaking, and we want to listen. Lord, we pray, God, that you would build your church and that you do it through us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.